Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, Assistant Professor of Communication and Media at Loon University. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. Got a really interesting episode lined up for you today with my guest, Dr. Mark Pack. He is the president of the Liberal Democrats in the UK. And Dr. Pack has a really interesting background because he covers all types of guests that we have on the show. He's an academic having a PhD from the University of York looking at 19th century elections. And he also has experience as a digital campaigner having run the digital operations for the Liberal Democrats in the 2001 and 2005 British General elections. And Dr. Pack has a new book out entitled Bad News, What the Headlines Don't Tell Us, which is a practical guide for readers to better understand the flaws of news coverage and how they can become better consumers of news, for example, by using social media. So we'll talk about the book in the beginning of the interview and then move on later to talking about Dr. Pack's experiences in British digital campaigning, which is also written about in an academic context. And last but not least, Dr. Pack hosts the Never Mind the Bar Chart podcast, which deals with all the latest developments with the Lib Dems and British politics. So you can check that out at nevermindthebarcharts.com. But without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Mark Pack. Again, he is the president of the Liberal Democrats. Dr. Pack, thanks so much for taking the time out and welcome to the Social Media and Politics podcast. Lovely to join you. So first off, I'm really excited for our chat because your background covers all types of guests that we have on the show. You're an academic (laughs) and you've worked as a digital campaigner and currently head a major British political party. So I've got several questions for you, but why don't we start out with your new book, Bad News? The book outlines several problems with the way news is reported, including how social media has contributed to the news getting worse over time. So can you outline your motivations for writing the book and the role that social media can play in actually making us better consumers of news? Yeah, I think one of the pivotal moments that made me think, hang on a minute, maybe I know something that is useful to write in a book that other people might find interesting and helpful and maybe even practical, was looking at a news story where there were some quotes in the headline. And I realised that I had learned over time that if you have quote marks in a headline, that makes the following story much less trustworthy. Quote marks in a story itself, direct quotations from people, generally is a sign of credibility, that you know, here is something that's the actual words that someone else has said. And, and so quote marks in a story is a bit like footnotes in a book. Uh, they're a general sign of quality and accuracy. And But quote marks in a headline mean the exact opposite. A quote mark in a headline means... The news outlet isn't actually willing to stand by the headline. So if a report says Donald Trump made racist comments yesterday, if the word racist is put in quotes in the headline, that's the news outlet stepping back and saying, well, we don't want to quite commit to whether or not we think it's racist and therefore we're putting it in quotes. Now, with that example that I've given, you could maybe argue it both ways as to whether news outlets should make those sorts of judgments. And certainly that's been a big debate in the US media through 2019 and 2020 in particular. But imagine a different headline, which was Donald Trump stole three million dollars. If that's presented without quotes, that's the news outlet saying this is true. If the news headline, however, is Donald Trump, quote mark, stole three million dollars, close quote mark, what that's telling you is somebody has said this. And actually, we as a news outlet don't have enough evidence one way or another to come to a judgment. So it's almost a warning sign that maybe what follows isn't to be trusted. So the quote mark thing was just one example where it made me think, hang on a minute, maybe there's something interesting here. And what that then really made me think about what could be useful with the book is that the general tenor of discussion about the media is about reducing trust in the media and how people trust news outlets less than they used to. However, on social media, you get almost the opposite experience, which is people are very, very willing 
to cite their agreement and even how they've maybe been angered by a story where even the most superficial of checking of the story would give you some reasons to doubt it. So although we've got this big picture of declining trust in the media, we also have day to day people placing almost too much trust in individual stories that they come across. And so I thought, well, maybe a practical guide to how to make sense of stories would be useful. And there are certainly some really good academic studies, but it did feel to me like a more popular guide, the sort of thing that you might have at the back of your mind when scrolling through your Facebook newsfeed or your Twitter timeline or or whatever would be useful. And fingers crossed from initial reviews and sales, I hopefully haven't been completely alone in my view of that. <laughs> yeah, and one of the interesting arguments in the book is that while you can use social media to get the news, you can also use social media to verify the news. So can you kind of unpack that dynamic? Yeah, and I think this is massively advantageous that you have readily accessible a whole plethora of different viewpoints on major stories. And even on relatively niche stories, through social media and through Google and Bing and other search engines, you've got a whole load of other information very rapidly accessible. And this is a huge improvement on people's experience of the media from you know, even only a decade or two ago, where the common pattern would be that you might have one newspaper that you would read and it would be that newspaper and only that newspaper. And there might be one TV channel whose news bulletins you would watch and it would be that TV channel and only that TV channel. And therefore, finding contrasting versions of events would be really hard particularly as also the news in terms of newspapers, TV, radio was ephemeral. So to give an example from my childhood, when I was growing up and there was the miners' strike, hugely controversial, long-running industrial dispute in the UK, my media consumption as, as a sort of kid at the time was the BBC News and the Times newspaper. Now, I've sort of learned since how partial the picture I got of the miners' strike was from my news consumption. But even if I'd been more aware at the time, it would have been quite hard to hunt out those other perspectives unless you know on the day that, oh, hang on a minute, I've just read something in the Times today that maybe I don't believe. Perhaps I should nip down to the news agent and buy three other newspapers that day. Now, even if it's as soon as a day after, you're then stuffed. You know, it's a big deal to then go to a library to look up old newspapers. So it's become so much easier to get alternative perspectives. Now, obviously, not everyone always does that. And sometimes we don't have time to. And sometimes those alternative perspectives are just flat out wrong. But it is really, really healthy to be able to do that. And I think that's why if you want to make sense of the news, Overall, things are in many ways much better than they used to be. It's also a lot easier to be fooled by the news. But if you want to make sense of it, it's actually easier now than it used to be. Definitely. And I, I want to pick apart a couple of the uh, chapters in the book that I found particularly interesting and that kind of struck a chord with me personally. And one is the chapter you have on election campaign coverage, which, <laughs> because, you know, we have a big American election coming up. And, you know, I've just been watching this over time, how poorly the news has been reporting about uh, the impact of social media on politics and elections. And I think a lot of the claims that are either explicitly made or implied, they go to publication without necessarily verification from scientific evidence. And so with the US elections around the corner, what type of flaws in election news coverage should our listeners look out for? I mean, I think the basic flaw is that an awful lot of time is spent in elections covering issues, covering campaign tactics, covering developments, where nobody really has any idea of whether or not they're going to have an impact on the result. Or even very often there is good evidence they're not going to impact the result, but yet they're reported as if they're much more important than they really are. So just to give you an example at the moment, as we're recording this about 30 odd days before the 2020 US presidential election, there's a lot of media coverage about registration numbers in different US states and how many people are joining the electoral register and registering as Republicans versus how many joining and registered as Democrat. And the implicit lesson we're meant to draw from all those stories is that it matters that if more Republicans get registered than Democrats, that gives the Republicans an edge in the election. And that has a superficial plausibility about it. 
But it might not be true. I mean, it might be that actually registration numbers are a symptom rather than a cause of political success. But what happens is the more popular a party is, the more popular a candidate is, the more likely their unregistered supporters are to get registered. So it might be that it's it's not really something that's determining the result, but maybe they're still giving us a clue as to what the result might be. But on the other hand, it might be that there's no real relationship between registration numbers and election results. You know, if you were doing an academic article on this topic, one of the most basic steps that, you know, you wouldn't even get through completing your first draft before thinking about, let alone what reviewer number two might say, (laughs) is, okay, what's the past evidence? How well do registration numbers correlate with election results? And if there's a state where there was an unusually skewed set of registration numbers did it end up with an unusually skewed election result you know really basic thing of trying to find out if there's a relationship between this thing that we're talking about and the election result but that sort of analysis is completely absent from all of the media coverage i've managed to find about registration numbers at the moment and so you get very often these stories that talk a lot about a tactic or a phenomena and they're completely devoid of any evidence about Is this really going to influence the result? I'll just give you maybe another example, which I guess may be particularly of interest to listeners of this podcast, is there's been quite a lot of stuff about deep canvassing and this idea that maybe the way to influence voters is to have very lengthy one to one conversations with them. And it is sort of almost a fashionable Democrat grassroots campaign tactic that gets talked about at the moment about the importance of deep canvassing. So I was having a look the other day at a presentation from one of the sort of grassroots Democrat organisations that's been really touting the values of deep canvassing, the people's action strategy. And looking at their document about deep canvassing, they talk about how phenomenally impactful it is. They talk about how there's a 3% overall impact on decreasing Trump's vote margin if you have these long one-to-one conversations with people. And that sort of tenor is similar in media coverage as well, that talks about how deep canvassing might be the future of politics. It might be the way the Democrats manage to defeat Trump and so on. But let's just do a really basic bit of maths. So if you do deep canvas conversations with 100 people, and the evidence is suggesting that as a result, Trump's vote share falls by 3%, So three fewer people out of 100 say they'll vote Trump if you've done a deep canvas conversation with all 100. Well, what that means is if you manage to canvas 100 percent of the electorate, okay, you'll knock Trump's vote share down by 3 percent. Clearly canvassing with a long one to one conversation with every single voter, quite a tall order. But even if you manage to canvass, say, 10 percent of people, which would be about 25 million people in the US. So that would be a phenomenally big operation, having long conversations with 25 million people. But if that's only 10 percent, then that 3 percent means you've only reduced Trump's vote share by 0.3 percent. And you sort of think, is an operation that puts so much effort and resource into getting 25 million conversations and as a result only knocks the vote share down by 0.3 percent, that sounds like that this is really a tactic that just doesn't scale at all. That maybe you'll be super lucky in a massively close election result that you happen to have had more conversations in a particular tipping point state than the eventual margin. But it's going to be basically a matter of pretty close to blind luck, whether or not you can have an impact. And yet all the media coverage around deep canvassing is how exciting it is and how interesting it is. And it's again missing that bit of basic maths that in this case seems very strongly to point towards there's no way this can scale well enough to have an impact on the result. Now, perhaps proponents of deep canvassing have a really good, compelling counter argument. But the problem with the media coverage is that the media coverage doesn't even apply that initial degree of scepticism about let's do some basic maths. Could this possibly scale? really doesn't look like it can. OK, let's ask the deep canvassing advocates why on earth they think you know these numbers are wrong. So that's a really consistent pattern. And one thing I talk about in the book is actually you look at a lot of the coverage at the Barack Obama 2008 presidential campaign. When you scratch under the surface, it's really hard to see the, the sorts of campaign tactics, particularly digital tactics, that the media really eulogised and praised in 2008. Really hard to see that that had anything 
more than a very marginal, trivial impact on the election result. So that's the long version of my answer to your question. The short version is the basic problem is election campaign coverage talks about tactics without really giving you any sense of whether they're going to make a difference to the result or not. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we don't really see much follow up after the election mm. going back to to return to those themes, which is kind of interesting. But one of the things, and this is a, a kind of personal beef of mine, is, um, you know, you have a chapter in the book dealing with pundits or mm. political <laughs> commentators. And, you know, with the election heating up, I get a, a lot of emails from like professional marketers saying, here's this well-known pundit who's been on all these TV shows and would you like to interview them for the podcast. And then I use one of the tips from your book, which is, you know, go check out their social media to try to investigate who these pundits are. And a lot of times their expertise doesn't really line up with what they're talking about. So, you know, what's the deal with these pundits and, and kind of do you think social media has been a way for pundits to really market themselves to get mainstream coverage? Yeah. And I, I mentioned in the book my own sort of little run of being a pundit on a BBC politics radio show here in the UK talking about Welsh politics. Now, I'm not Welsh. I've never lived in Wales. I've been to <laughs> Wales, but, you know, I'm not Welsh. I can't speak the Welsh language. I, why on earth did I end up several times in a row being on that show? The answer is because it's a show that's very early on a Sunday morning and the BBC also doesn't pay its uh, contributors on such shows. And I was willing to set my alarm clock for stupidly early on a Sunday morning to go and record something for free. And that, frankly, was a significant part of the reason why <laughs> I was on several times. Obviously, I was sufficiently coherent and sufficiently knowledgeable and sensible in what I said, that it wasn't just a one off invitation. But what I think that my experience illustrates is how much being a pundit is not about having particular specialist expertise on the topic that you're talking about. Some of it is simply av about availability. Some of it is also about a willingness to give non-nuanced answers. And this is why uh, academics quite often don't make for good pundits. <laughs> <laughs> the sort of caveats that naturally come to academics are not what you want from a pundit. What media outlets in particular are looking for are pundits where you can have two especially who will spark off each other who will disagree who will give you in that sense a lively debate which is entertaining may not necessarily be informative but is entertaining and if you're really lucky one of your pundits will say something sufficiently outrageous that that can be the headline and the social media message that will get some traction online and help get a larger audience for you so being really good and accurate at what you say is actually quite a small part of the consideration as to who gets invited to be pundits. Definitely. And so uh, just so the podcast listeners know, there is some gatekeeping going on here in terms of uh, <laughs> who our guests are. And, you know, there, there's lots more tips and discussions about news coverage in the book. Um, but before we move on to digital campaigning, where I know you have a lot of expertise as well, uh, why don't we do a quick plug for your podcast, Never Mind the Bar Charts? What's that podcast about and where can our listeners find it? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to plug the podcast. So you, people can find it at nevermindthebarcharts.com. Uh, for any non-UK listeners, the title is a reference to a sort of long-running feature of Liberal Democrat election literature here in the UK, where bar charts are used very commonly to help try to communicate a tactical voting argument because we have first past the post electoral system. So the one thing that most people who know a bit about politics often associate either jokingly or, or more seriously with the Lib Dems is bar charts. And so as you, you might guess, the podcast mainly focuses on the Lib Dems. But what I try and do is bring in a range of guests who have much broader expertise. So I've just recorded a show uh, with Professor Rob Ford up in Manchester, and we talked a lot about the long-term demographic and social trends in the UK that helped bring about the Brexit vote in the referendum a couple of years ago. So hopefully of interest, not only to people interested in the Lib Dems, but have got a broader interest in British politics as well. Definitely. And, you know, you have a lot of experience there. And so I'm very excited to get your take on some aspects of uh, digital campaigning, because you were head of innovations and running digital for the Lib Dems in the 2001 and 2005 general elections. And that's a really interesting time period, because that's kind of when they had the emergence of the blogosphere and the internet. But it wasn't 
wasn't really yet uh, that social media had been fully developed. So can you tell us how digital campaigning in Britain was like back then and to what extent the Internet changed political campaigning for British parties? Yeah, it was a very different world when I started because Facebook didn't exist, Twitter didn't exist, YouTube didn't exist. And in fact, when in 2000, we had the ability for people to donate via credit card on a candidate's website, that was a first then in British politics, a very, very different world. I think there are some similarities, though, uh, one of which is the importance of email. An email, I guess, particularly helped by Barack Obama, has sort of come back into fashion in the last decade. But for a long time, people were getting excited about new social networks and so on and and used to, I think, neglect the importance of email. Because the great thing about email is you can push your message directly to somebody, particularly in the EU. You obviously have to have the right permission to get their email addresses and so on, which is a bit harder here than, say, in the US. But that ability to push a message directly at them through email you know, was and is still massively powerful. One of the other sort of common trends between then and now, I think, is that it's very hard to reach floating voters via digital campaigning, except through paid advertising carefully targeted at them. And therefore, the biggest benefits often are either from the internal audience, so recruiting and mobilising members and supporters who then in turn go on to do campaigning that reaches people via other ways, or using social media to build relations with and to attract the attention of the media. So, for example, here in Britain, just about every member of the lobby in Parliament, the sort of elite group of British political journalists, as it were, almost all of them are on Twitter And lots of them are active on Twitter and will engage with people on Twitter and so on. So there are lots of ways that you can use social media to, in the end, improve the amount of media coverage that you get as a party. And that media coverage very often reaches much, much larger audiences than a bit of online content does. I think the biggest thing that's changed has been that rise in the role for targeted online advertising and in particular Uh, what you can do with Facebook in terms of quite tight geographic targeting, which is especially important in electoral systems where you have relatively small constituencies or wards. And particularly if you also have first past the post, that ability to really narrow target on the marginal swing seats and marginal and swing voters is exceptionally important. And of course, you can try to do that with your direct mail or your door to door campaigning. But Social media advertising has added a really major addition to that in a way that is yeah, mixed, I would guess I would say, in its impact on the health of democracy. For sure. And, you know, you sort of mentioned the importance of, of using social media to get uh, media attention. And you've written about some of your experiences uh, doing that in academic articles. Uh, for example, one co-authored with uh, Darren Lilliker and Nigel Jackson. And in that article, you outline how the Lib Dems, in being a smaller party than the Tories or Labour, had more room to innovate with using web-based technologies. And you outline how uh, the Lib Dems' primary goal for their digital initiatives was to influence the offline debate via the media. So for all the critique of the media that we've been discussing earlier, why were they the primary target for these initiatives rather than the citizens themselves? Simply the scale of the audience that you can reach. So if you do something online that then gets cited in the media, you can reach far more people that way than your normal direct audience. And so, for example, I've occasionally had tweets that have been, say, picked up by the BBC and may, you know, maybe reproduced on the BBC website. And that audience that you reach that way is massively greater than the audience that you can reach directly, except for a very, very you know, small number of global almost celebrity figures. But even for them, even and again, maybe you know, Donald Trump may be coming to mind for some listeners. Sure, Donald Trump has a massive Twitter audience, but you know what he's really good at? He's really skillful at sending tweets that the media then cover. And so the media then takes it to a much, much bigger audience beyond that. So that sense of using social media as a extra doorway into media coverage is really important. And there is a, it would be too far to say that there's an egalitarian aspect to it, but I think it has at least made politics a little bit more permeable for outsiders. 
it's certainly not a level playing field and there certainly are advantages about who you know and how much money you have and all of that but it is a bit easier for outsiders to break in and i think that's probably the impact that in the end social media has most had on british politics which is that it's made it easier for parties who are on a bit of a roll to turn that into a much more successful surge and we saw this for example with the snp after their defeat in the last scottish independence referendum a few years back they managed to turn that into a massive surge in party members and hence money that has been a significant part of their continued political success subsequently and likewise with my party the liberal democrats have had this slightly weird record over the last few years of getting massive surges in membership after something has gone really badly wrong (laughs) i think we'd probably rather the last few years had gone better uh, even if we'd missed out on the membership surge but again it's an example of how you can get a huge you know, influx of members, because all it requires is somebody to go online, click a couple of things, enter their credit card details and bingo, you've got a member. It's much, much easier than it used to be. So I think that does sort of magnify the surges of parties. But more generally, I think the impact of the internet and social media, particularly on British politics, has been a bit more like the telephone industry than the music industry. By which I mean, if you think about how the telephone industry has changed as a result of the rise of the internet and then of social media, there have been some quite significant changes. You know, we all have data plans on our mobile phones now, and the public phone box is a declining, decaying phenomena on the high street and so on. But fundamentally, the telephone industry is the same as it was 30, 40 years ago in that it makes the bulk of its money by charging people a monthly fee. And in that sense, how you make money, the underlying structure of the industry of a small number of private companies or one state monopoly supplier with monthly fees, that is absolutely recognisable now to how it used to be. The music industry, by contrast, the way you make money has changed massively. And the equivalent of the monthly fee, what used to be the music industry's financial standby, the money handed over for a physical copy of a single or an album, that has massively declined. And the music industry has had to change in all sorts of ways to bring in income through other sources. And British politics has ended up being much more like telephones than music in that respect. It is the basic shape of politics is still recognisably the same as it used to be. Lots of details are different and there is a bit more of that ability for outsiders to to permeate in and there is a bit more of that ability to amplify surges. But in many ways, it is fundamentally recognisable as what it used to be. Hmm. And thinking about, um, you know, how you can uh, get media attention, whether it's good or bad, and that leads to, to party membership. I think about what is the role of the BBC there? And what I mean by that is, you know, the BBC is this large public broadcaster that is kind of the flagship media of Britain. And we don't really have an equivalent in the US, right? There's PBS, but the major networks are sort of fractured uh, along party lines. So, I mean, I would imagine that, you know, getting media coverage from the BBC would be like, you know, the best case scenario because it has um, the sort of broadest audience. So what do you think that kind of large public service broadcaster has in terms of, you know, as a a party strategist getting coverage, does that have some dynamic that's maybe different from the US? Yeah, I think the BBC is the very obviously different element of the media makeup in Britain compared to very many other countries. I think in terms of politics, there are two other factors that are also worth bearing in mind. One is that we have national newspapers in Britain in a way that they don't really have in the US. But the other, which is often overlooked, but is really crucial, is that it's not only the BBC, but all the TV channels here in the UK have a version of the sort of same impartiality requirement. So there is a degree for all of them to not be like Fox News. And there is that basic regulatory requirement. And and in a way, I think that is almost more significant than the BBC in that it's every news channel has to try to treat to some extent each party fairly in an election. Now, there's a lot of controversy over what fairly means, because 
if you judge fairly by, say, in proportion to their success at the previous election, you're therefore permanently locking out newcomers or parties that might be surging in support and so on. And so this is often you know, a matter of a lot of debate as to what fairly means. But that is the really big difference that to an extent, politicians of sort of all stripes will get a fair hearing across all of the TV news channels. And so yeah, there are all sorts of exceptions and controversies and so on. But if you look at that bigger picture, it's a very, very different picture from the one that you have in the US with that much more open partisanship of TV channels being permitted. And what that also means, of course, is that you have sort of swing voters more evenly distributed across different media channels because you don't quite have that same sense of you know Tory voters congregate around TV channel X and Labour voters congregate around TV channel Y you have much more of a mix across all the TV channels obviously the newspapers in Britain without that uh, impartiality requirement do have much more of a congregating of, of voters in different places so that makes the TV news important in a very different way I think from how it is in the US plus of course TV advertising is not allowed here in the UK. Political parties get a very small number of free sort of TV slots, but it'll be two or three minutes every few months or every week or so during an election campaign, every few months outside an election campaign. So it's really, really minimal as an alternative for TV advertising. So all of which makes the sort of winning, as it were, the editorial battle in TV news coverage much more important. Yeah, and that brings me to um, you know, something I'm personally interested in. I've, I've done some research on British televised debates, and one of the you know hallmarks, I think, of British political history was the 2010 party leader debates between Nick Clegg, Gordon Brown, and uh, David Cameron. That was the first uh, actually televised British debate for an election campaign in history, which came a lot later than than American debates. And the interesting uh, part of that was that the challenger at the time, Nick Clegg, who uh, was leader of the Liberal Democrats, really had this uh, huge spike in popularity after the first debates because he used techniques like talking direct to camera and came across as more authentic to voters. And so, you know, for all of the kind of digital initiatives that campaigns were running at the time, would you agree that that televised debate was really uh, kind of the biggest break for the, uh, the Lib Dems, something that came through the mainstream media rather than digital media? Yeah. And I think there was an impact of technology, but the impact was with the speed of opinion polls immediately after the debate. And so we've got quite used to it now. But in back in 2010, it was a bit of a novelty that opinion polls on who had won the debate turned around so very quickly after the debate finished. And that had a very significant impact, I think in influencing how the media then covered that debate and especially the extent to which the tabloid press in the UK which is much more politically partisan than the TV stations they're not covered by anything like the same sort of impartiality requirements they gave a really positive write up to how Nick Clegg had won that TV debate in a way that I strongly suspect that without that batch of opinion polls to show what the truth was it's likely they would have reverted much more to type in terms of saying that their guy won. And some of that was internet polling, some of it was telephone polling, all of it was you know, required technological innovations that were not available 10 or so years prior to that. So I think that was really the biggest impact of technology in many ways on the 2010 election. What it did also illustrate is one thing I think the Lib Dems got wrong in that election was there wasn't really a way of turning the surge of interest in the Lib Dems immediately after that TV debate into activity in the marginal seats that the party was targeting. And so that did illustrate the weakness that you can have if you don't have your infrastructure set up right, but also the possibilities that you can tap when a surge comes. If you do have it right, there's so much benefit you can turn that into. So that 2010 TV debate didn't produce anything like the surge in party members that, for example, Nick Clegg's 2015 sort of concession defeat speech did. And it's a bit weird in a way that, you know, Nick Clegg had two central national media moments in 2010, a massively popular one, breakthrough performance in that TV debate. In 2015, his speech on having led his party 
into an absolutely disastrous election result. The 2015 one is the one that produced the huge surge in party members, <laughs> which is not what you would expect. You'd normally think the success is. And one of the reasons for that is the party had the right infrastructure in place in 2015 in a way that it didn't in 2010. Which makes sense because it's hard to have that infrastructure in place when it's you know the first time you have a debate to, for example, fundraise or increase membership off of. Yeah. And the scale of it was also quite unexpected. And if you think back to previous dramatic moments in British politics, they've not quite resulted in that same 48 hour period of madness, as it were, as it felt (laughs) like the 48 hours over that first TV debate. So things like when Britain dropped out of the ERN, the exchange rate mechanism in 1992, in terms of direct impact on people's lives, massively more important event than that TV debate, but also a massively important political event, though, and one that shape the Tory party's electoral problems for the next near 20 years. So massively important, but it didn't quite produce that same immediate surge of like or hate in the way that that TV debate did. And and maybe in part, that's because we've all got used to now reacting much more quickly, because that's the world that we live in with our smartphones and so on. And I've not seen any sort of rigorous academic research on this be fascinating if if there is any as to whether the speed with which we react to events has increased but that certainly seems to be the case in in many respects in politics definitely and you know i want to ask uh one more question about nick clegg because he's interesting in that he had this breakout moment was deputy prime minister under this coalition government with the tories which was also a very interesting moment in british politics uh but has recently left political life to join facebook as their vp in global affairs and communication so since you're kind of on the inside of the party how is that viewed within the party is that seen as a sort of positive or negative development or kind of what's the uh, internal look at that move from politics to industry Um, It's not something I think people think about very much in the sense that, you know, after he, you know, led the party into the disastrous 2015 election result, he was a, you know, good, decent collegiate member of the party, you know, through the next couple of years, uh, but is very much a figure from our past now. And so it's of passing interest in that sense. Know that that's the role that he now has, but he has, you know, very much disengaged himself from the Lib Dems, and in a way, the Lib Dems have disengaged themselves from him as well. It's more a quirk, as it were, rather than a a factor that people sort of particularly have in mind. The thing that I find fascinating about Facebook's decision to appoint him is is it strikes me that the problem Facebook has with its comms is very similar to the mistake that Nick made when leading our party through that 2010 to 15 coalition, where there was a, particularly this came through with tuition fees, but not only tuition fees, there was a, you know, he has a real belief that if you can just sit down and talk about things sensibly, you can persuade other people to agree with you. And that's an admirable outlook in many ways, but it's not really how politics works. And some of those bigger pictures questions about brand reputation and trust and so on are really important. And it's not just a matter of saying, well, look, can we just sit down and talk about paragraph three, sentence seven, you know, calmly and rationally and see what we really agree or disagree with about the subclause within that. And it strikes me that Facebook's weakness in many ways, one of its weaknesses in many ways with its comms has been a similar sense of just we want to fix this detail and we want to fix that detail as opposed to an understanding of that much bigger branding and trust challenge that it faces. Now, obviously, you know, and many of us have been through this ourselves in all sorts of other ways, you know, sometimes when you make a mistake, and you learn from it, you actually then become one of the best people at not making that mistake again (laughs) subsequently. So I I continue to sort of have a look with interest as to how Facebook's comms have been changing over the last couple of years since Nick has been in that post, because to my mind, at least, I think it's still a bit of an open question as to whether he will end up amplifying some of Facebook's weaknesses in its comms approach or whether he will really help them fix them in a way that if you compare... (laughs) 
Facebook with, say, Microsoft. Microsoft are a good example, a really good example of how a company has massively turned around its reputation in terms of now being seen as, relatively speaking, one of the good guys when it comes to trust and privacy and security and the like. So it can be done. And yeah, it's a a story to be continued. Definitely interesting one to follow. Um, My last question for you has to deal with a point that you bring up in bad news as we have the U.S. elections coming up. And that's, you know, so often the narrative is framed about what other countries can learn from American digital campaigns. And given its uniqueness, uh, it might be hard to translate some of those practices to different contexts. So I'd like to flip the question to what could American campaigns learn from British digital politics? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, I think. There's a fairly straightforward policy answer to that, which is around regulation. You know, here in the UK and across the rest of the EU with GDPR, we have a massively different approach to personal data than in the US. But not only that, Section 230, which is often talked about in the US as being the legal underpinning of the modern Internet and all of that, is you know an important political and regulatory issue in the US. But my goodness, so much of the coverage of Section 230 in the US is written as if the internet only exists in the US. And so for every social network, Facebook, Twitter, for all the big other tech companies, Apple, Microsoft, for all of them, the vast majority of countries, over 90 percent, and you're often up to 98, 99 percent of the countries they operate in, do not have Section 230, and yet they're able to successfully operate in those countries. And so there is a huge myopia, I think, in the US that overlooks that there are lots of other ways of tackling the sorts of issues that Section 230 tries to address. And yet the conversation in the US is almost as if it's, you know, the internet only exists because of Section 230, when it just, if you're looking at that debate from outside the US, it is so obviously untrue because, hey, I, you know, I'm using the Internet. You're using the Internet. People listening to this have probably used the Internet in some way to get hold of the podcast. Loads of places operate without Section 230. Now, obviously, as you know, in the EU, there are often variants of Section 230 that take slightly different approaches, but sort of have roughly the same impact. So it's not like the rest of the world is you know, completely ignoring the sorts of issues that Section 230 covers. But I think it's a really, if I was trapped in a room with a US regulator or politician <laughs> for a minute, I think that would be the point I would want to make to them. Please just look at the rest of the world. And remember, you know, you've got an amazing set of test beds in all sorts of different countries of other ways of doing things. Surely you will end up making your decisions in the US better if you don't think of these issues as being ones that are unique to the US. Um, In terms of campaigning as opposed to policy, the answer I would have given a few years ago to this question is one I think US political parties have actually mostly learned, which is the value of thinking about data and technology as a year round activity, as a permanent year round activity and not something you simply create and gear up in the run up to an immediate election. I think the both Democrats and Republicans have moved much more towards having that permanent data and tech infrastructure. So I think in terms of things, you know, possibly still to learn or, you know, that that say work in Britain, but where they've not yet really been applied in the US, I do think there is still a lot of value in understanding the best ways of gathering responsibly and ethically and legally data about people. And so one of the main techniques you see a lot of political parties in the UK use is some form of survey that asks people their views on local issues, maybe tries to pick up particular bits of casework that they need help with, and sort of legitimately and ethically as part of that process also gathers various data that can then be used to help follow up and target appropriate messages through appropriate channels. And so you see a lot of elected politicians in my party, for example, maybe doing an annual resident survey. Well, they'll do a survey like this of all of the residents in their electoral district. And I think the value of those sorts of surveys, both for making democracy healthier, but also purely from a narrow campaigning perspective as well of gathering data that you can then use effectively is huge. And I'm surprised that those sorts of surveys have 
such a small role in US politics compared to their role in British politics. Hmm. It's interesting. And, you know, we've <laughs> covered quite a bit of ground here. So, Dr. Pack, thanks so much for taking the time out and sharing your insights with us. Not at all. Lovely to be talking to you. I've just been speaking with Dr. Mark Pack, president of the Liberal Democrats. His latest book is Bad News, What the Headlines Don't Tell Us. And you can find a link to that in the show notes. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next episode, heading into the U.S. elections, I'll be speaking with Professor Terry Towner of Oakland University about the latest American poll results and political campaigning on Instagram. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Melba. See you next time. <laughs>